Pitts book. And I got the cover up here just to make sure. I always do the wrong hand there uh, in case people pop in later and see what we're talking about. We're talking about the Mwangi Expanse, the newest Lost Omens uh, expansion uh, uh, source book here that we've got going on. Uh, really excited to break into this thing. I haven't opened it yet. I picked it up yesterday from the local game store. That Their shipment came in a bit late. Um, but it's the first time I'm opening it to see what's in it. I watched a preview video of it a little while ago, so I have a little bit of an idea of, of basic things that are in it. But kind of kind of look through it together. Ooh, apologies for the page noises. That's kind of loud. All right, so table of contents. We've got Reclaiming the Expanse, the history. Makes sense. People of the Mwangi, a bunch of different um, cultures, and then some ancestries. We have uh, Anadi, Kanrasu, Knoll, love Knolls, uh, Goloma, Gripley, Shishk, and other people. Very cool. Uh, a bit about religion. Looks like different gods of the Mwangi, which looks really cool. Geography, all about different areas. Um, and looks like we might have some more about specific things. I'm not sure what all the... There's Blood Cove, Jaha, Kibwe. I mean, maybe these are um, settlements that I know Kibwe is a big city because you, um, you in the slithering takes place there. Mazali, Nantambu, Osibu, Senor, 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 maybe? Usaro, Viridian, Vidrian, and a bestiary, which is really cool. So I'm going to flip through uh, some of this. I'm not going to go into super detail about everything, but I mean, we'll look at some of this awesome artwork. Check the, this one for Reclaiming the Expanse. Cool stuff there, so a bit of history. We got a nice new close-up map. I say new. It might be just uh, like a closer version than what we have in like the core book for Mwangi. We have Age of Anguish, Age of Destiny. We got a bunch of events throughout the history of the area, which is really cool. Let's see, we have the Age of Enthronement, and then the Age of Lost Omens, which is the present. It says 46, 4606 AR to 4721, which is the current year, and that is, um, uh, what's his name? Not Abadar. What's the other god? Uh, I totally lost the name in my head. I knew it. Oh, Aridin. It's right there. Aridin Reckoning. Very cool. A sweet gorilla person. Love the artwork. The artwork for Pathfinder 2 has been stellar. People of the Mwangi. Here we got a bunch of different um, cultures, different groups. The Baykar, the Banuat, Kaldaru, Moxie, Sargaven. Obviously, I don't know if I'm saying it, half of these right. I'm just kind of guessing based on what I can figure out. We have the Vidric and the Zenj. All different cultures down there, uh, which is pretty exciting. Other groups, there's Elephant People. The Elephant People are an offshoot tribe of the Moxie and Osirian peoples who many generations ago discovered proof of ancient Osirian elephant worship. So I don't think they're actually like Loxodons from D&D. From &D. I think it's more... They call themselves elephant people. As a result, they have no collective name beyond that of the animal companions. They're simply referred to as the elephant people. So they worship and have a bunch of elephants. That's really fun. Oh, we have different types of elves here. We got the Ali J. Nice artwork there. Really cool stuff. Love it. They have the Redeemer Queen. We got a new item, the Genealogy Mask. Lots of information about these people. Tons of, there's like one or two pieces of art. There's like a piece of artwork every page. A lot of awesome stuff here. Magisa, so we have different places. Yukuje, different type, another different kind of elf. Man, this book is pretty. All right, I'm going to kind of flip through this part to get to the ancestries. We got a lot of information about culture. If you want to build up, uh, you could probably supplant this almost anywhere you want in the world, too. If you're playing in Galarian, or even if you're not playing in Galarian, you could have it somewhere else. A lot of information you can t to, to build cultures. A place called Cloud Spire. We know how much Pathfinder loves its spires. 
Really cool looking place there. Looks like we got, oh, they're dwarves here. Taralu. Another place. Taralu people. Whew, more dwarves it looks like. Moengi dwarves. Songo halflings. Oh, I love this one. Very flower power. Nice. <laughs> oh, this is good stuff. A lot of great pictures that really give you a feel for this area of the world. Like you wouldn't see anything like this up in um Oh, I forgot the name of the the other continent, the continent to the north. Which name escapes me right now. It all starts with an A. Matanji or uh Mwangi orcs. Again, really cool, solid designs. Love this stuff. Half works as well, of course. They have some NPCs. Uh, okay, so here we are to the ancestries. We have Anadi. Anadi are reclusive, sapient spiders who hail from the jungles of southern Gar Garand. Though they act in many ways like natural-born shapeshifters, their twin forms actually stem from carefully developed magic. Spider people, medium-sized spider people. This is the Anadi, which is super cool. He's holding a scarf there, he or she. Let's see, hit points 8, size medium, speed 25, pretty basic. Ability boost, dexterity, wisdom free, but they get a ability flaw to constitution. Oof. Languages, Anadi, Mwangi, other things. Of course based on your intelligence modifier. They have a change shape action. You can change your hu you can change into your human or spider shape. Each shape has a specific persistent appearance. In your human shape, you can't use unarmed attacks granted by your ancestry. In your spider shape, you aren't flat-footed when climbing, but you can't use weapons, shields, or other held items of any sort, nor can you take any action that has a manipulate trait. <laughs> so that's kind of awesome. You just change back and forth to a medium-sized spider. You were born with natural means of hunting and self-defense. You gain a fangs unarmed attack that deals at D6 piercing damage. Your fangs are in the brawling group and have the finesse and unarmed traits. Obviously not while you're in your humanoid form. Cool. Fun, fun, fun. So if you ever read the Anansi Boys by Neil Gaiman, it's kind of like Spider, their, their dad. What is going on here? We have the Kanrasu. Kanrasus are shards of cosmic force given consciousness who construct intricate exoskeletons to interfere with the mortal world. Both an integral part of the underlying process, processes of the universe and strangely set apart, Kanrasus look to aeons to understand their existence. So we have a construct here. That is a really cool thing. So that's really interesting. So they kind of build themselves Wow, crazy. Hit points 10, size medium, speed 25, ability boost with constitution, wisdom, and free, ability flaw to charisma, and then they have some language to uh, traits. Uh, so sunlight healing, interesting. The Kanrasu can enter a meditative healing state as a 10-minute activity when exposed to direct sunlight, in which they recover D8 hit points at third level, and every two levels thereafter, this healing increases by 1D8. Once a Kanrasu has recovered hit points in this way, they're temporarily immune to further uses of sunlight healing for one day. Really cool. They could just heal themselves in the sunlight once a day. That's really neat. There says a physical description. The true form of Kanrasu is an abstract chunk of spiritual essence. While their being exists beyond the truth of humanoid senses to the mortal eye, their body usually resembles a globe of light, darkness, or space. Floating eternal pinpricks of illumination set inside the ball. These cores surround themselves with bodies made of still living wood, creating that form the most people recognize as Kanrasus. Really neat. So the whole body thing, they just manipulate around them. Some other ways they build themselves. And we have like a almost spider looking one. They can take whatever shape they want. That's really neat. And we have gnolls. This is what I was looking forward to. Powerfully built humanoids that resemble hyenas. Gnolls are cunning warriors and hunters. Their frightening visage and efficient tactics have given them an ill-starred reputation. So gnolls look pretty much like you see gnolls have, you know, for a long time in different D&D &D type games. Uh, hyena people. 
They have eight hit points, size medium, speed 25, ability boost, strength, intelligence, and free. Interesting to get intelligence. I like that. A bit different than other other places we see them usually. Uh, an ability flaw and wisdom. Languages common to null and other languages. Of course, they get a bite attack, d6 piercing damage, and low light vision. So nothing crazy there. They don't have any bonkers abilities or anything, of course. You can be an ant null, a great null. Ant null, so the um, ant null is actually small instead of medium. But they get trained in deception. Sensimoto checks not cover. Okay. A great null. You can be a large, powerful null. You get 10 hit points instead of 8 in game. Plus 1 circumstance to athletics, chips to trip and shove foes. That's what I would do. That sounds awesome. They're real big. And then we have a sweet breath null. What? You're a striped pale furred null with oddly pleasant breath, which you can use to enchant entrance your tra your prey. You're trained in diplomacy or another skill if you're already trained in diplomacy, and you gain a plus one circumstance bonus to make a ch make an impression if the target can smell your breath. What? Oh my god, that's hilarious. I love it. Oh, here's a little ant null. My gosh, it's cute. And then we have a different kind of null over here. I love these things. I don't know. I always found gnolls very interesting. Witch gnoll. Cast Ghost Sound Cantrip as an innate spell and gain plus one circumstance bonus to checks to impersonate and create a diversion when using your voice. Neat. And then we have the Goloma. This one sounds... I'd never heard of these before. Golomas fear most other people and deliberately use their unusual biology to frighten off those they consider to be dangerous predators. Rarely seen and poorly understood, Goloma's many-eyed and wooden-faced vis visages instill terror in most they meet. Huh. I'll show this picture before we talk more about these Galoma. Cool stuff. Almost look horse-ish. They don't have hooves, though. They got, like, more like paws. It says, though just as capable as being dangerous as any intelligence creature in Galarian, Galomas have a deep-rooted psychological understanding that they are prey, and they are too... and that all two-eyed people are predators. Hmm. As a result, Golomas rarely reveal themselves to others, and when they do, they often adopt threatening personas as a mean to protect themselves. Even though these, even those, even those few Golomas who venture out into greater, greater Mwangi society often have trouble relating to other ancestries due to the strong differences in perception and mindset. So they are kind of horse-like-ish, kind of like a like an antelope. Like they are always the prey; they always get eaten, so they have to really lash out in order to to not seem. To, to be threatening so they don't get eaten, I guess. Hit points 8, size medium, si speed 30, ability boost, wisdom, and free. And then eyes and back. You have eyes that point in several different directions and instinctively notice movement in the peripheries of your vision. When you use the seek ba basic action, you can look for creatures in two areas instead of one. If precision is necessary, you can select two 30-foot cones or 15-foot bursts within line of sight instead of one. Interesting. So they're really good at seeing around them. You can get low light vision as a far sight galoma or frightful galoma. Trained in intimidation, pretty basic. Intimidating glare, kind of typical things you see for ancestry for heritages within an ancestry. I like the idea of a vicious galoma. You get a claw on arm attack that does d6 damage. Again, pretty basic. You can detect magic if you're a vigilant galoma. That's actually really cool. I like that one a lot. Whoa, okay, I thought I saw this image before. This looks really cool. This must be a, a vicious Galoma. I love this picture. That is super cool looking. Almost makes them look like rock. Are they wearing armor or they just change their shape like that? That's really cool. I don't see anything about them being shape changers in any way. Maybe that's a frightful Galoma. Makes it has the off-putting appearance. That's really cool. And they don't, they hide their face, I guess. And we have the Gripply little frog people. Gripplies are shy and cautious people who generally seek to avoid being drawn into the complicated and dangerous affairs of others. Despite their outlook and small stature, Gripplies often take bold and noble action when the situation demands it. So we have frog people. Cool stuff like forest frog, or um... Tree frogs, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, hit point six because they are small sized, 25 foot movement, 
Ability boost, wisdom, and free, but ability flaw and strength. Interesting. They have a flaw, but they only get two boosts. Is that... I feel like typically if you have a flaw, you typically get three boosts. That's weird. Uh, and they have low light vision. They don't have much going on. Let's see. Maybe they get uh, awesome heritages. So we have poison hide gripply. Maybe small, but the poison glands concealed across your body hide a deadly defense. You gain the toxic skin reaction, which is once per hour triggered when a creature touches you, such as grappling you, successfully hitting you with an unarmed attack, or using a touch range spell against you. Okay. We exude a deadly toxin. The triggering creature takes D4 poison damage. Basic fortitude save using your class DC or spell DC, whichever is higher. At third level and every two levels thereafter, the damage increases by D4. Okay, that's not bad. I um, guess you kind of want to get people to touch you <laughs> to take advantage of that one. I like it. Snap tongue gripply. Your tongue is especially long. You can launch it with extraordinary range of precision. You can use your tongue to deliver touch range spells and perform extremely simple interact actions such as opening some types of unlocked doors. Your tongue can't perform actions that require fingers or significant manual dexterity, including any action that will require a check to accomplish, and you can't use it to hold items. That seems a bit underwhelming. I like the idea that you can just be like, and touch stuff, I guess. That's cool. I like this name a lot. Sticky Toe Gripply. Hands and feet skewed. Exude a film that helps them adhere to surfaces. You gain plus two circumstance bonus to your fortitude and reflex DC against attempts to disarm, shove, or trip you. When ascending trees, vines, and other foliage, if you roll success on the athletics and check to climb, you get a critical success instead. That seems pretty uh, useful. And then a wind web gripply. Tough webbing along your hands and toes can slow any fall. As long as you have one hand free, you take no falling damage, regardless of the distance you fall. Wow, that sounds super handy. Okay, that's really good. I like these gripplies more and more. That's really neat. We have some other pictures here of a gripply archer of some kind. We have a very different interpretation of the tree frog aesthetic. That's fun. Uh, then we have Shisk. Shisks are a secretive mountain dwellers. Bone, bone feathered humanoids who lurk underground in dark tunnels and caverns. Their fascination with collecting and protecting esoteric knowledge is one of the few things that can persuade them to explore the outside world. So they have quills, it looks like. So they look like humans, but instead of hair, they're covered in these quills. I think there was an X Man named Quill one time, at one point, that just could shoot quills out of her body like that. Very similar to Marrow or Spike from X-Men Evolution, but I think it was she couldn't control it very well. Hit points 8, size medium, speed 25, and ability boosts intelligence and free, no flaws. And then Dark Vision. Pretty basic. Um, surprised they don't... I mean, I'm sure they have feats and heritages that do something with the quills, but it seems like that would be... I'm surprised that's not built in. Let's look at some heritages. We have Lore Keeper Shisk. You grew up surrounded by knowledge and secrets. You become trained in one lore skill and one other intelligence or wisdom-based skill of your choice. At fifth level, you become expert in the chosen skills. Okay. Spend a lot of time reading, I guess. Quill Coat Shisk. Your body has adapted a defensive mechanism to break off your quills in an attacker, allowing you to defend yourself against aggressive predators, though it takes a while for the quills to grow back. You gain the barbed quills reaction. This is kind of what I was thinking of. Uh, I bet it'll be similar to that Poison Frog one. So Barb Quill's reaction once per day. Triggered when you're hit with an unarmed strike or strike with a non-reach melee weapon. You break off quills in your attacker's flesh. You deal D8 piercing damage to the triggering creature. A basic reflex save using your class DC or spell DC, whichever is higher. On a critical failure, the creature also takes D4 persistent bleed damage as your quills hook into its flesh. I like it. At third level and every two levels thereafter, this damage increases by D8, and the persistent piercing damage increases by 1. Interesting. It says it takes a while for the quills to grow back, because you can only use it once a day. I guess that's what they mean there. So it takes a day for that to grow back. Spellkeeper Shisk. Your magical knowledge allows you to cast simple spells. Choose a cult or primal. You gain one cantrip. You can cast this as an 8th spell at will. As a spell of your chosen tradition, a cantrip is heightened to spell level equal to half your level rounded up. That's super handy. Uh, having any type of just free spell stuff is nice. Uh, cantrips are so good in this game that, that that's fantastic. 
and then a strong gut schisk. Well, there's one more after that. Your metabolism is slow, allowing you to go for days without food and pro process maladies at a slower late, slower rate. You can go one week without food before you begin to starve. Additionally, the onset times and lengths of stages of all diseases and poises after they that affect you are increased by 50%. If the onset time or stage is instant and only lasts one round, this ability has no effect. Pretty cool. That's kind of a neat one. I like that. And then Stone Step Shisk. Navigating mountains and other rocky terrain is second nature to you. You can ignore all you can ignore non-magical difficult terrain caused by rubble and uneven ground made of stone and earth. Yeah, pretty basic, but not bad. Another image of a shisk playing a xylophone. Pretty cool. Alright, then we have other peoples that don't have rules. But just other people that would live in the Malingi expanse. So we have the Boloco. Carnivore, carnivorous fae. We have bogards, which I think are kind of like froggish people. Cat folk. Oh, yeah, we have pictures over here. Oh, the Biloco. That's a cool image up here. They almost look reptilian. They look like nasty kobolds. Yeah, bogards are for, like nasty frog people. We have the charuaka, uh, like mandrills. They look like big baboons. Uh, lizard folk, of course. We have kava. No picture of a kava. Uh, kobolds live here, of course. Leshies, lots of them. Lizard folk, naturally. Mbike. Planar scions, sabosins, serpent folk. Nice. I'm here on to our chapter about religion. A little bit about different gods of the Mwangi. Set up just like um, the Gods and Magic book. A couple here. I won't go into too much detail here. Um, I'll show off particularly cool looking ones. The World Shaker, the Golden Lion, Kohar, Grandmother Spider, Calicot, which looks really cool. There's Grandmother Spider. She's got a bunch of arms. Calicot, um, that's how I'm going to pronounce it at least. He's really cool looking. Spooky face. Chaotic neutral. Interesting. The Baiko, another chaotic neutral. Luhar, the setting sun. Looks like a Lamia that's like jet black except for uh, its eyes and some jewelry. That's cool looking. That is a lawful neutral. God, we have... Ugh. Do we want to try that? It's like a haired serpent. Neutral good, mother of hearth and wall. We have Tlehar, the rising sun. Looks like a cat folk god with a cool mor morning star. <sighs> it's hard to hold up this book sometimes with all this stuff in the way. Oh, we have a cool... The diamond ring, like a giant serpent in the clouds. Uvuko? Uvuko? That's really cool looking there. Volcana, the God King, Awful Evil, and other religions talking about how the other typical gods of Galarian are here, Desna, Gozra, the Green Faith, Lamashtu, stuff like that. And we have our geography chapter with a really cool picture with our advanced player's guide careers. We got investi the Investigator and swashbush Swashbuckler Iconics, so names I don't remember. <laughs> so a bit about what it's like here, the climate. Different uh, areas, Arzakul, the Barkskin Lake, Dark Reach, giving a lot of personality to this area that I don't know how much it was covered in Pathfinder 1, but we got a lot more going on here, a bunch about the Mwangi jungle with this cool green dragon hanging out, looks like some ruins, all overgrown, probably because there's a big green dragon there. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna skip to the bestiary because this geography chapter is long. There's a ton going on here. I think this also covers different cities, uh, like Mazali here, very similar to the Lost Omens World Guide, how it's set up, a bit about the city, what kind of imports exports it has, what's it known for. Sweet map. 
And again, you can always use these things wherever you want. You could totally transplant that map of the city to wherever you are setting your campaign, which is pretty sweet. Think about how the ruling class and whatnot, who's in charge there. Man, Tambu. I love these names. I, they're so good. All right, let's go to the bestiary. I'm sure that's what a lot of people are interested in. What kind of monsters are we have here? Okay, that's quite a few. Oh, okay, so the first it has, what kind of monsters can you expect to find in the Wangi Expanse looking at the different bestiaries? So first off, we have this giant monstrous hippo, and then a big old list of, of typical monsters you can find in the Wangi Expanse from other books. Of which books they're in, bestiary one, two, or three that we have so far? I don't know if we're getting more bestiaries or not. Well, we have some new things. An Anadi, Anadi Hunter. It's interesting, they look like they're midway through their spider and human shape here. Uh, this you have the humanoid, there's like a humanoid spider. Real interesting. And then we have just in the spider form over here, but as an adventurer, <laughs> it's kind of also got a backpack on and a wand or staff. We have oh, a guy with eyes on his feet. I, I, got, I got Muxa. Looks like something out of um, Guillermo del Toro movie. Uh, awesome Bosom. Big old looks like a looks like a dire sloth. Oof, he's spooky. I like it. Monstrous hairy humanoids with cold iron fangs and muscular limbs and powerful hooked claws. Yeah, it's a dire sloth. <laughs> we have the Biloco, a crocodile snouted fae who stalk the Moengi jungle and feast upon the flesh of humanoids. So these are mentioned in the other people, but they're not a playable race. Ancestry. So we have the Biloco. They're pretty cool look looking. They look like they'd make a good enemy. Just because they got that. Just kind of stereotypical evil-looking face. The Char, uh, Charuka? Charauka? Charauka, I'm going to say. These guys are cool. These are the ones that are like uh, baboon mandrill people. This one's wearing a, a, a skull mask. And here we have another one. That must be the butcher with his comma. Very cool. A Groot slang. What is going on here? We got a many-tusked elephant with an expanding mouth that is like a linorm, where it's got two legs in the front and a big, long tail. Looks like scaled like a snake. That is a weird monster, and I like it a lot. That's really cool. That is a Groot slang. Creature 16. So, big, strong boy. It's a gargantuan creature. Whew. 370 HP. <laughs> It's got swallow hole, of course. I love to see that. That's always fun. Wow, that's really cool. Greater constrict. Jeez. Let's look at the basic attack here. Jaws. Plus 28. 3d10 plus 15 piercing. Plus improved grab, because it tries to eat you. It's got a foot attack, a jaw attack, a tail attack, and a tusk attack. Whew. The tusk is plus 30. 3d12 plus 15 piercing. Yeesh. I think they're all 3D, 3D 10 plus 15 or 3D 12 plus 15. That dude hits hard. Let's see, we have the Kanona. Kanona are only half human and only half in the most literal sense. <laughs> they, their body is literally sp split down the middle between physical and something else. They most often resemble the right half of a human and less frequently the left half, split perfectly down the middle, starting at the crown of the head. A faint shimmer in the air like the waves over a hot stone hints at where the other half would be. Interesting. A kava. These are interesting. They look like a lemur, but they he's holding a, a weapon. <laughs> That's kind of creepy. But they're not very strong. Are they small? They have small humanoids, but they look like a lemur. We have a Karina, also known as plague birds. Are large owl-like creatures with dark red feathers, powerful talons, talons and unsettling eyes oh yeah actually large size creature five they're really cool looking too like as always the art in this is fantastic 
Oh, here's a crazy hippo. Um, Malady. Malady? Maladi? I don't know. It resembles a... Jeez, it's gargantuan. Creature 17. Massive hippopotamus surrounded by a collar of flame. Yikes. Lawful evil creatures here. Again, gargantuan. Over on the other side, we have Mamlambo. A river predator is a hypnotic bioluminescent skin, similar to crocodiles, with a narrow head at the end of long necks resembles a horse skull. Oh, this thing is freaky looking. Look at that thing. That's just weird. Creature 9, neutral evil, big old aquatic beast. I like it. We have a rompo. You eat corpses. Looks like a, a weird cat. <laughs> Then we have like an Oroch, a big cow, a Segulo, Golo. It's a creature 14, but it just looks like a big cow. Interesting. A Solar Ibis, a big bird. A medium-sized bird, but that's a pretty big bird. And we have a Zimba, a large snake. 10th level snake. Pretty cool. I like the colors on him. Does he have swallow hole too? Yup. <laughs> of course. My unhinges jaw and eat whatever size creature it wants. Whew. All right. Well, that's my initial flip through of the Mwangi Expanse Expan uh, Lost Omens source book. Really, really cool stuff. I can't wait to dive into it deeper. I think I'll do a full, like, proper review later on. But uh, I want to do more stuff like this talking about it. Um, I have been working on a TikTok series as well. Uh, I am at Dan Cole, Dan Cole 22 or you can follow the Professional Casual Network on TikTok. I post the same things there uh, where I've been going through the different careers and just kind of a quick overview of what the different, I'm sorry, careers is Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, the different classes do. Uh, uh, overviews of them for Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Uh, also, am a player on the Lost Omens podcast. Where we are, as an actual play, we're playing through the Extinction Curse. I play a rat folk investigator named Brennan, and it's, it's fantastic. We're at the time of recording of this, we're near the end of book one of the Extinction Curse, and Danny is running through that, and she is awesome. She's super fun as DM and having to keep control of the five of us. Yahoo is playing through that. So uh, if you haven't yet, check out professionalcasual.com for all kinds of stuff that we do and hope to be doing more of these. So thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Thanks for hitting that like button and all that stuff, and I'll see you later. Hit the wrong button. No, don't do that either. <laughs>